it's a delight for me to be here. It, can you hear me? Just wave your hand if you can hear me. Great. Okay, because I can't. I can't tell otherwise. <laughs> um, I think I, I. The one thing I would add to what Claudia said is that I am a member of the Book Club of Washington, and I enjoy being a member from afar. And so it's wonderful to be able to join your meetings like this now that you're doing some with Zoom and, and online. I was at your last meeting and it was terrific. Uh, I, I joined the Book Club of Washington a few years ago when my son and his family were living in Seattle and I was coming up there quite frequently. Unfortunately, they've gone to, to Washington DC so I don't have an excuse to come up to Seattle anymore but I, I still look for ways to come and uh, hopefully I'll be up there sometime this next year and have a chance to see some of you in person. But let me move forward. Uh, I'd be glad to tell people more about California Rare Book School when we're, when, when we're done today uh, during the question and answer period, but let me get started with what I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'm sorry if I have to look down at my paper and look away from the screen, but I've got, um, but I will fill the, sh the screen up with my PowerPoint, so that will give you something to look at. I've collected almanacs for a number of years now, and I just wanted to share with you, this is the oldest one that I have. It's from the year 1732, and you can get some sense of how fragile these are. And then the youngest, so that's the oldest one that I have. This is the youngest one that I have. <laughs> you can still buy almanacs if this is something that interests you. But let me start. The title of my talk is The Other Book. The Ames Almanac Opens a Window on Colonial America. At, le at least two printed books could be found typically in the home of the American colonist in the 18th century, the Bible and the Almanac. Since, since religion and by extension the Bible played a major role in settling the colonies in North America, I like to think of the Almanac as the other book. In my talk today, I will focus on it and share with you some examples of what I've learned by collecting them and reading them. Information about the social fabric of the culture is embedded in almanacs and from them we can glean information about contemporary life, including the ideas and predictions of the future circulating at the time about science and medicine, economics, government, and societal and cultural practices. While education and literacy were on the rise during the 18th century, both the Bible and the Almanac were read intensively rather than extensively. That is to say, both the texts of the Bible and the Almanac were read slowly and closely, word for word. Often they were read aloud. They were read for study and serious reflection they were read and reread over and over again. This is the character of intensive reading. These texts did not lend themselves to extensive reading, which was more rapid, silent, once through, and often strictly for pleasure. In order to open a window on colonial American life, I ask you to join with me in some intensive reading of parts of a number of almanacs from my collection. I will do some reading aloud to accompany some of the images, and I hope from the images you will gain some sense of the physicality of these almanacs. They are small pamphlets printed on a single sheet of cheap paper, often the same paper used for printing of newspapers. <clears throat> and in the early 18th century, once printed on both sides of the almanac, te almanac text, this sheet of newsprint was folded and then the folded edges were cut to produce an eight leaf, 16 page pamphlet. 12 pages were given over to the months of the year, one each 
beginning with January and ending with December, which left one page for a title page and three pages for additional information. Toward the end of the century, some almanacs contain, contained more pages, but 12 were always dedicated to the months. The almanacs were not bound like books. Instead, their bindings were usually crudely hand sewn. They may have been sold unsewn and perhaps it was up to the purchaser to sew, sew the leaves together. Some of the printing was not well inked and or too well inked and many now show the ravage of time. They are, are often fragile and worn, which of course we all would be if we turned, if we survived more than 250 years. Unfortunately, digitally scanning almanacs in combination with these other factors, their fragility and so forth, makes them nearly illegible in some cases. And you'll see that as I show you some slides today. But before we look at images of almanacs, let me give you some context from which to view them. What is an almanac then? An almanac is a sort of astronomical calendar of the weeks and months of the year, providing the movements of the stars, giving the times of sunrises and sunsets, and predicting the weather and other matters. Molly McCarthy, an independent scholar who wrote Accidental Diarist, a history of the Daily Planner in America, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2013, called the almanac the first iPhone. The first almanac printed in America appeared in 1639. Since it was a calendar, colonists kept them handy. They were, they were written for every man, that is, men, women, and children. We can start looking at some now. Here's, here's uh, one from 1737. And you see that here's a page for the gentlemen. Here's a page for the ladies. If I'm going too fast on the slides, just wave your hand. Now this is not very well legible. You can see that the uh, that this is this is to give children uh, some definitions. Oh, I went too far. Let me let me go. Let me go back. Here we go. You see, he's he said here since the characters in the almanac are not uh, understood by many of my young readers, and then he goes on to explain that this is this is to help them. He's giving symbols and words for children. So that's another example of how these almanacs were for everyone. Typically, the household almanac was hung from a loop of string by the hearth in the center of the colonial home, as evidenced by these examples going back to the 18th century. So here we see one from 1767 that has that loop for hanging it by the hearth. And another one with just the residue of the, of the loop. This one, 1766. And I think I have a third one. Yes, this is 1789. There's, there's the loop that was incorporated in the binding so it could be hung up. By hanging it by the hearth, it was made accessible to everyone in the household, men, women, children, servants, and slaves. If it were taken down for reading, it is likely the reading would be allowed. Again, the reading would be heard by men, women, children, servants, and slaves, including those who were illiterate. Furthermore, a French historian, Bolem, has said, has argued that the illiterate and semi-illiterate could use almanacs because they can't con contain symbols and pictures. At the end of the old year, when the new almanac had been purchased for the coming year, the old almanac would be taken down from its peg by the hearth and it would be thrown into the fire to be destroyed. The new one would then be hung in its place. The passage of time, size, 
lack of a binding, cheap paper, heavy use, and burning at year's end have all contributed to the destruction of 18th century almanacs, yet they survive still. These pamphlets were never controversial. There is no evidence to make the argument that they were. There is no record that any printer was censored for publishing an almanac. No one was arrested for printing an almanac. There is evidence to suggest that printers kept the type standing for their almanacs in order to print more copies when there were, when there were lulls in the printing office. Edition sizes were quite large. They are estimated at 15,000 copies per edition. For the production of this admirable necessity to public happiness, the printer tried to associate himself with, with persons skilled in mathematics who should be able to compile annually an almanac for the local meridian. The fame of Poor Richard, created by Benjamin Franklin, has been so great since the days of its first appearance that the layman thinks of, of, of his work as comprising the sum of colonial calendar making. But Poor Richard, Abraham Weatherwise, Theophilus Crewe, John Warner, Benjamin West, Nathaniel Ames, Benjamin Benneker, who was, the, was an African-American scientist, and numerous others uh, and undistinguished writers prepared almanacs of ex excellent quality for the printers of their communities to issue regularly in the fall of each year. There is evidence that at the beginning of the 1750s, but at least that at least one author's almanacs were extremely popular, leading to their being printed in multiple editions and in some cases pirated editions. Once we begin to see multiple printers at work producing one almanac and pirated editions, we can be sure that the particular almanac reproduced so many times was a money maker for its author and for the printer. This brings us to the person named in the title of my talk, Nathaniel Ames, who lived from 1708 to 1764. He was a physician and innkeeper in Dedham, Massachusetts. He fathered Fisher Ames, the famous American statesman, orator, and political writer. Most importantly, he was author of the Astronomical Almanac Diary and Almanac, which was published annually for 38 years with a Boston, New England imprint. This remarkably long publishing run began in 1725 when he published the first for the year 1726. Following his de death, another son, the third Nathaniel Ames, authored the almanac until 1775. Samuel Briggs, in his work, The Essays, Humor, and Poems of Nathaniel Ames, says, thus eight years before Benjamin Franklin had started his almanac, Nathaniel Ames was publishing one that had all its best qualities, fact and frolic, the wisdom of the preacher without his solemnity, terse sayings, shrewdness, wit, homily, wisdom, all sparkling in piquant phrase. He carried into the furthest wilderness of New England some of the best English literature, pronouncing there perhaps for the first time the names of Pope, Dryden, Butler, Milton, and repeating their choice fragments of what they had written. So what is the content of 18th century almanac? It's a calendar, I've said. While one does find literature in 18th century almanacs, the almanac is first and foremost, foremost a calendar, and every almanac has a page for each month of the year. Let's look at one of those pages. This is June and July. These month pages are intimidating because they usually consist of columns filled with what at first seem like meaningless numbers. If you have ever set type, you will see immediately why, print, why a printer would have 
would would leave the type standing for an almanac if there is any likelihood of its being reprinted. Setting the type for such pages must have been time consuming and tedious. If you study for a few minutes, the month pages shown here for June and July 1737, you will see that the first and second column list the days of the month and the day of the week. So look to the left, the, the, first, the first two columns, and you see that M and W. Unfortunately, I don't have a point, point well, wait, can you see my cursor? Uh, okay, so I can use that as, I can use that as a pointer maybe. I lost it, let me try again. So here's the month, the, the day of the month, and here's the day of the week. Uh, let's see. The third column is the widest. Let me try with the cursor there. You see, this is the, this is the third column. It's the widest. It offers occasional weather predictions, thunder and rain, and more heat and more thunder. Historical trivia, like King George II began to reign in 1727. Scientific data, no high spring tides this month. Folk wisdom, dog days begin. You know, the dog days of summer, dog days begin. And possibly political information such as court dates. The Hampton Court, the Court of Salem and Bristol and the artillery election in Boston. The last three columns so these, these columns right here, this one, this one, this one, this one. The last three columns are based on astronomical calculations. First, there is the rising and setting of the sun with a number for calculating the time of high tide. Then comes the phases of the moon followed by the hour of the rising and setting of the moon. The almanac was also literature and history. Essays, proverbs, aphorisms, and poetry in great abundance, abundance all can be found in almanacs. Liter literary references are there to be deciphered by those with classical education. Ames proudly presents the poetical accomplishments of a 12-year-old boy in 1751 by placing his poems at the head of every single month page. You see this, let me use my pointer here if I can. Right here you see for January this, this poem that is at the head of the month page, that's what he meant. That, that poem was written by, by a um, uh, this poem was written by a 12-year-old 12, 12 boy. Chronologies of important historical events usually begin with the creation of the world. In 1745, this was given as 5,695 years ago. I'm not sure what it be, would be for now. The Almanac was also a guide to good health. During the period, many thought that the phases of the moon had an influence, usually positive, on various parts of the body. Look closely. Let me go back one slide. Oh. Let me, here we go. Um, Well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get back to the slide that I wanted to be at. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Now, my, my images of you participating block the particular column that I wanted to show, but at the far left, or actually the far right of the screen in, in the, the columns over here. Um, 
you'll see that, that um, you'll see words like knee, legs, head, neck, arms, breath. And now if we look at this crude woodcut that appears under the title, The Anatomy of Man's Body, um, in the Ames Almanac for 1729, you'll also see, see the, those words. All the body parts have a sign of the zodiac associated with them. An arrow points from the sign to the body part in the image. Notice what is labeled in the lower, with a lowercase m. See this right here? And the word secrets. And then if you look at the image, let's see we find that M again with these lines pointing to the private parts. <laughs> if you look closely at the image, we'll, you will see that these two des that these designate the private parts of the, of the person represented. And so what I would ask, does the use of the word secret, secrets reflect some pure modesty perhaps? Is the almanac giving guidance regarding the best day for sex? More intuitive reading is, is necessary to answer this riddle. The matter of temperance is taken up in the almanac for 1744. Let me see if I can get to that. Here's another example of the, uh, the, the anatomy of man. Here we go, 1744. Uh, on the left hand side where it says courteous reader, you have the beginning of an essay about temperance. Here, this is an, a blow up so you can see it better. You have often heard of the, and this is, this is what he, he says in, in this, Quoting from the Almanac, you have often heard of the advantages, temporal and spiritual, that arise from temperance. And if you take notice of that divine poem written by the best of English poets, i.e. Milton's Paradise Lost, after Adam's vision of the disease, which is a dreadful scene, the angel tells him that abstinence was the sole method of escape from the ruinous assault of those diseases and obtaining long life. He continues, then believe me if I tell you that if you would enjoy health and stand a good chance of a long life, you ought to abstain from morning drams. How many youthful athletic constitutions have been ruined forever and the narrow span of human life con contracted by two thirds of its breadth by unreasonable tippling in the forenoon. Indeed, there are some iron constitutions that can stand the force of their own extravagances, but how many wear out their constitutions before they arrive to 30 years of age and die as it were of old age in the very prime of life. He that can gain a habit of abstaining from strong drink in the forenoon is in but little danger of being drunk in the afternoon. Notice that how Ames manages to slip a reference to Milton in at the beginning of this little homily. He was well educated and this is typical of his style. The almanac also taught astronomy. On the very same page, we see Ames teaching about astronomy. Again, the instruction to the courteous reader, reader about guarding against drink early in the day, we find, a, a, excuse me, above the instruction to the courteous reader, we find a list of eclipses that are going to occur in 1744. He predicts four, two of the sun and two of the moon. He gives the precise date and approximate times of these events, but he says they will be invisible. I assume that means that they will not be seen from the meridian of Boston in New England. Following this list, he tells us that the planet Venus in the morning star 
is the morning star until August 9th. After that, it will be the evening star to the end of the year. Another nice bit of astronomical science appeared in the Ames Almanac for 1737. The last leaf contains a two-page essay addressed to kind reader. It begins, you may remember that in the year 1734, I answered objections against the Copernican hypotheses. And in the year of 1735, I argued the similitudes of the planets to this earth and the probability of their being inhabited with creatures in like manner as this earth is. He goes on to give how things would appear to an eye in each planet and discusses Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, and Earth's moon. Finally, that's, that's this essay. It's not, it's, not, um, it's not legible for you, I'm afraid. Finally, he can, concludes, Mr. Durham asserts that, th that there is mountains, rivers, and seas in the moon, and others deny it. I cannot tell. But if I had the machine of the little Spaniard who flew thither, I would go and see. I should see the earth turn upon itself. I should have the pleasure of viewing all the seas and continents on earth, even those that lie near the poles, yet unknown and undiscovered by us. What a glimpse into the future. I do think that the machine of the little Spaniard that he referred to refers to Domingo Gonzalez, the hero of the 17th century book by Francis Godwin entitled The Man in the Moon or A Discourse of a Voyage Thither by Domenico Gonzalez. Gonzalez managed to harness a team of wild swans to fly around the world and ultimately to make a 12 day flight to the moon. Once there, Gonzalez spends six months with the inhabitants of the moon, only returning to Earth due to homesickness. Published in London in 1638, The Man in the Moon is now seen as a very early work of science fiction. We find an image of a solar eclipse in the, in the Almanac for 1752. It's to the left. It's this image. I think I've 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 got a yes. I've got one that you can see a little bit better. You can see the the eyes, the face of the moon, the two eyes, and then or rather the sun, the eyes of the sun, and then the moon coming to cover it up. Can you all see that? I hope. It's also in this almanac that we learn about the change in the calendar made by the act of British Parliament. There's a note at the bottom of the page. Let's see if I can point it out right here. There you go. When this almanac was sent to the press, I had no certain account of the act of Parliament reducing the year to new style. That's what we've got there. In 1753, we get a full explanation of the change from the Julian calendar or old style, abbreviated OS, to the new style. Here's 1753. Let's see. I think if, if you look at this page over here, you begin to, you see old style, and so it's giving you the date in old style, but then also over here you have the dates in new style. Ever the teacher, Ames says, since this is the second year corrected to solar time and the general date of all Europe 
and almost all the almanac writers for the year and their several performances gave some account of this matter, I should have only confirmed to the act of parliament without saying anything further. But for the sake of many that take my almanac have not seen or heard what has been said by others, I shall attempt to give them the reasons. The main intention is striking off the 11 days between the 2nd of September and the 14th of September, AD 1752, to produce a uniformity in com computation of time throughout the Christian part of the world. He continues by noting the inconveniences caused by the change, birthdays, payment of debt especially. Having anticipated these problems, he has inserted a fourth column in his table for each month, giving the old style date. And that's what I hope you can can see in this one, although it's very hard to see it. In the same almanac is predicted the transit of the planet Mercury over the body of Sun on Sunday, May 6th, and that's what this uh, diagram is about. Ames calls this a curious phenomena that has not been mentioned by other almanac makers in New England. The almanac served as a political tract as well. As we have seen, the almanac was a calendar, it was a guide to good health, and it was a tool to teach astronomy. It was also a non-controversial political tract. As I noted earlier, to my knowledge, and no almanac was ever censored and no almanac writer was ever imprisoned over content, yet radical ideas can be found in the content. For example, Ames would interline humor in more serious phrases in the third and wider column of his month pages. Some of these lines were proverbs, but others in retrospect seem like political commentary. In 1742, he wrote, law and liberty strongly urged. <clears throat> and in 1743, the truth appears plain by the liberty of the press. In 1748, rum, sugar, tobacco, tea, lemons and limes, how excessively used these later times. And in 1750, some liberty, but oh, where's property? In 1758, 10 years before the Stamp Act, Act debacle and 18 years before the first shots, shots were fired in the American Revolution, we find Britain, oh, let us give one dire blow before you let your injured hands go and let us awake our alls at stake. And also a union of counsel and affection in the common cause will produce good effects, but discord and disaffection ends in disappointment. This copy has an owner's scratched a manacle in the margin to signify the importance of this last pre pre passage that I read. I, let's see, I think we can get a little closer to it if you can read sideways. <clears throat> uh -huh. here's, here's the manacle. He is also commenting about a cow getting into someone's pasture, I think, or dying. But here's, if you, if you can read sideways, you can see the, um, the small note right there. Let us pause and look at the Almanac for 1758 more closely. For many years, Ames went to one printer, John Draper <clears throat> of Boston, excuse me. He went to John Draper of Boston for the publication of, the, of his almanacs. In the 1750s, that changed. Though Draper was the sole printer in 1751, 52, and 53, he was joined by James Parker of New Haven in the colony of Connecticut in 1754 and 1755. 
1756, Daniel Fowle, New Hampshire's first printer, joined the other two. Since Fowle moved from Boston to Portsmouth in the summer of 1756, it is likely that the Ames Almanac he printed that fall for the year 1757 was one of the first New Hampshire imprints. The next year, the 1758 Almanac was brought out in no less than five or six editions. One could say it was a bestseller. One or two editions were printed by John Draper in Boston. One was by Eads and Gill, also of Boston. One was by James Parker. One was by Daniel Fowle. And a sixth was brought out by Tim Timothy Green of New London, Connecticut. At least one or two of these editions may have been pirated. Since the probable edition size was about 15,000 copies, there could have been as many as 90,000 copies Isaiah Thomas suggests maybe 60,000. Of this one particular almanac circulating in three colonies, clearly the popularity of the Ames Almanac was growing and colonial printers were gravitating to, to it looking for commercial success. By 1765, four of the five firms, Draper, Eads and Gill, Green and Fowl, were still in business and all four published newspapers. John Draper, who died in 1762, brought his son and his nephew into the business before his death, and the firm continued with great financial success, as Draper and Draper, Eads and Gill was also a great financial success. While Green and Fowl continued in business, they were less well off financially to be known as a printer of the Ames Almanac did not necessarily guarantee success. In 1759, nine printers brought out editions for Ames and by 1760, there were as many as 13 printers for a pub possible total of more than 195,000 copies of Ames Almanac in circulation for that year. But let's turn back to the 1758 Almanac. Let me show you four different co covers <clears throat> or title pages. Unfortunately, I lack the editions printed by James Parker, Timothy Green, and Daniel Fowle, but I have one with no printer named, so it may be one of the pirated editions. Once we have looked at the covers, we will look at some of the content. It will help you see why this year, 1758, may have been a turning point in popularity for the Ames Almanac. I like to call it the Subversive Almanac. And then if we see these, these title pages, here are two. In particular, take a look at these T's. And this one we, we can see is printed by, uh, oh God, Draper. And this one is also printed by Draper. They're both by the same printers, but look at the difference between the T's. I think that this T has clearly been, been replaced, the, 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 this, this second one. <clears throat> This, this demonstrates either type so worn by use that this letter had to be, re be replaced or a resetting of the type signifying two editions. And Draper, the imprint that gives Draper's name says that it's, there, it's being printed for the booksellers, plural. So they were all, obviously the almanacs were being sold at multiple locations. Here we can see the J. Draper for the booksellers more clearly in this one. And we get a better look at that second T that's kind of funny, but it also Draper for the booksellers. Here we see on the left, the Eads, Eads and Gill imprint. They were printing and selling it in Boston. The one on the right gives the place of publication as New England and indicates it was printed for the booksellers as well. It's a smaller size. So it's possible that it was a pirated edition. 
If we look at the covers of all of these copies, we find at the end the same two pages, two page essay written by Ames. More, more of the covers. Here's the essay. The title of this essay is A Thought About the Past, Present, and Future State of North America. The essay consists of an introductory sentence followed by three paragraphs. Let me read an excerpt of the words Nathaniel Ames wrote so long ago. America is a subject which daily becomes more and more interesting. A writer, probably Benjamin Franklin, upon this present time says that fertile country to the west of the Appalachian Mountains between Canada and the Mississippi is of larger extent than all France, Germany, and Poland, and all well provided with rivers, a very fine wholesome air, a rich soil capable of producing food, and all things necessary for the convenience and delight of life in fine the garden of the world. Have we not too fondly depended upon our numbers? Our numbers will not avail till the colonies are united, for whilst divided, the strength of the inhabitants is broken. If we do not join heart and head in the common cause against our exalting foe, but fall to disputing amongst ourselves, it may really happen, as the governor of Pennsylvania told his assembly, we shall have no privilege to dispute about, nor country to dispute in. Continuing, the future state of North America. Here we find a vast stock of proper materials for the art and ingenuity of man to work, work upon. So arts and sciences will change the face of nature in their tour from hence over the Appalachian Mountains to the Western Ocean. Huge mountains of iron ore are already discovered and vast stores are reserved for future generations. This metal, more useful than gold and silver, will employ millions of hands. Shall not these, those vast quarries that teem with mechanic stone, those for structure, be piled into giant cities. O oh, ye in unborn inhabitants of America, should this page escape its destined conflagration at the year's end, these alph alphabetical letters remain legible, legible. When your eyes behold the sun after he, he has rolled the season round for two or three centuries more, you will know that in Anno Domini 1758, we dreamed of your times. Signed, Nathaniel Ames. That passage always gives me goosebumps every time I read it. I, I just have to chime, uh, Susan, I just have to chime in here. That's fant isn't that just fantastic? It almost sounds like Whitman you know, a hundred yeah. years later, uh, yeah. there's just such a, uh, and, and, the, and the idea of America being as a, as a concept, not Canada, not Mexico, but America, uh, I just, I wondered how prevalent that was in well, 17. This, let me, let me go on because I say a little bit more. This was 1758. Okay. I'll, I'll shut up. That's okay. No, it, it was, it's a good place to stop for a moment and take a deep breath. <laughs> By, the, by close reading, that is intensive reading, of the 18th century almanacs, a picture of contemporary life emerges. First, we can see that the political issues of the day were war, expansion, a growing sense of independence from Britain amongst the colonists. If we read almanacs over time, we observe a transition from an agra agra agrarian society to a commercial one. We see an increase in the roads listed and court sessions given. Currency and rates of exchange are awarded more space. Second, we can see the promotion of certain ideas regarding science, health, education, economics, government, self-reliance, and societal cultural practices. I liken this to what I call the Spock effect. 
Dr. Benjamin Spock, some of you will remember him, was a pediatrician who wrote the very popular book, Baby and Child Care. This book influenced several generations of parents in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s to be more flexible and affectionate toward their children. As the colonists moved closer to unification and independence from Britain, we can see the Ames effect. Ames made an effort to challenge and change some of the common behaviors and beliefs of his day. We see predictions. At the very simplest, we see the prediction of astrological events. From scientific calculation, the times of the rising and setting of the sun and moon are foretold. When, eclipse will take, when eclipses will take place is made known. The anatomy of man's body predicts health and behavior. Even in this century, it is not surprising to hear someone suggest that the full moon has had an impact on his or her emotional state. Weather is predicted not just by days or weeks, but by months in advance. Even extraordinary human events, such as a union of the American colonies on the, on the near term and space travel on the long term are imagined by Ames. Both the occurrence of multiple editions and pirated editions of almanacs give evidence of how colonial printers gravitated toward what was commercially successful. Printing newspapers and almanacs required a capital investment in equipment and paper, and sales of these publications combined with job printing supported their other publications. Finally, the influence of some 18th century almanacs persisted and was felt well into the 19th century. Certainly the idea about self-sufficiency and self-government found in, in the almanacs fueled the American Revolution. The Ames essay, America, written in 1757, is the earliest articulation that I have been able to find of manifest destiny, a term coined in 1845. This appears to have been a commonly held idea before there were words for it. George, General George Washington is said to have said when asked, what will you do if you are defeated by the British? His answer one was, we will retire beyond the mountains and there be free. Since nine, nine, excuse me, since 90,000 copies of this almanac essay hung nearby possibly as many hearths for the year 1758. I cannot help but think that this essay had the impact, had an impact on its readers at the time. In fact, history shows us that it became accepted opinion amongst the colonists. As I said at the outset, Information about the social fabric of colonial American culture is embedded in almanacs. These almanacs have survived for us to read intensively so that we may discover this social fabric anew. So thank you for your attention. I hope that wasn't too long. I'd be glad to answer questions or hear comments from people. Let's, um, we can unmute uh, ourselves Let's see, I'm going to, um, uh, let's see, if I take, I'm trying to just see who I can see everybody here again. Uh, uh, let's see, can I take down the uh, screen at this yes, point? Yes, I'll, I'll do stop share. Okay. That should bring everyone back. Into yeah, the there we are. So that, uh, Susan, that was just terrific. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I have a few questions, and uh, maybe others do too. Uh, the one of the questions I had, and you really got into it there, um, about on the on the distribution of these almanacs, was there um, how many different almanacs would there have been done in like 1758, or was there just like the Ames Almanac was the standard almanac for uh, New England, or and did we have almanacs in, you know, in South Carolina and other other places? Well, they they all of the all of the the um, 
13 colonies had printers. Uh, in 12 of the 13 colonies in, in the 1760s, or at the time of the uh, Stamp Act, had printers that were printing newspapers. It was typical that printers that printed newspapers also produced almanacs. And so you would have had more than the Ames Almanac, but his, his was very well known and very popular. And we see that although he started out in Boston and New England, there were other printers that began to print his almanac in Connecticut and New Hampshire and so forth, so that it was available in more, in more regions, more colonies than just, just the uh, Massachusetts Bay colony. And of course, Benjamin Franklin was printing his almanac. He's, he's the one that we've all, we all think of, poor Richard's almanac. Uh, but again, he was, it was um, the, the, the moon rising and sun setting and so forth. It was all to the meridian for, for Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. And so there would be a need for various printers and almanac makers to have, to to produce almanacs in other colonies because of the different place geographically and the astronomical information they'd be putting into these, these almanacs. So I, I named about six or eight of the major almanac makers and they, they were all active during this colonial period. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, was a, it was a phenomena. I mean, we, uh, I, showed you, I showed you my 2020 <laughs> Almanac, it still goes on. It's still lucrative for people to publish these kinds of things. Um, the 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 um, oh, I, I lost I lost the thought. But the, the, there were there were a number of almanac makers, writers, and printers. Um, mm -hmm. And again, they were for each each colony sort of had its own. But but Ames was very well known in in the uh, New England area. So I see a question from Jerry uh, Williams. Uh, how did the price of, a, of an almanac compare to, say, the price of a book uh, back in those days? They were very cheap. They were, yeah. they were less expensive than, than books. Um, and if you bought 10, you got a discount. Hmm. But they're very cheap. I mean, it was, it was, one, it was one sheet of paper, basically. Mm -hmm. And you can see it wasn't, you know, this was one sheet of paper folded to this, to this size. I don't know how much you can see by my just holding things up this way. Um, you see the hand sewing. Mm -hmm. A book would have been more substantial, much more expensive. Right. These were these were a matter of pence. Yeah, right. And the wonderful thing is, even though they're so fragile, there's still you can still find them from antiquarian booksellers. So for me, I think I first got hooked because I was interested in being able to collect uh, something that was printed during the colonial American period. Well, you have a remarkable collection of the Ames. Uh, you quite a run, I take it. That's what you've tried to get as a run of the Ames uh, almanacs. I, I have. I have. I have a few other almanac makers, but I once I began to see that that Ames had written had written many very interesting essays that were the last two pages of many of his almanacs. Uh, I kind of got hooked on trying to collect a complete run of his, and I, I'm still, I have a desiderata list, list. Uh -huh. so right. I, I don't have a complete collection yet, and, right. and I, I have not, since I began to collect, I haven't found any from the 1720s on the market at all, and I know that if I, if I ever do, I'll probably have to pay a pretty p penny yeah, to get probably. those. More than a few pence. That's that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So Jody has a question here. I'll I'll just read it um, about the source of the information Ames used in his almanacs, such as the, the the scientific information that he had. So you mentioned he was quite well read, but there was so he must have had quite a library or or access to 
uh, scientific right. information. Right. Well, he, he, he went by the title doctor. And so I'm not sure what his education was, but he considered himself better educated than most people. And so he, he was the one that did the calculations, the, 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 uh, S, the astronomy calculations for his tables in wow. his, uh, in his almanacs. And then his, his son, um, Ames Almanac, Nathaniel Ames the third at that point, I think would have been his designation, uh, took over when, when, once he died in, this, in the 1760s and he, then he did the calculating and published the almanac until 1775. <laughs> so he, he published, he, he, he wrote everything. He, he um, compiled the literature, the, the poetry and so forth that he wanted to publish as a part of each almanac. Uh, I don't think he worried about copyright at that time. No. <laughs> there was there was no constitution yet that provided copyright law. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, I, I Jeffrey Long here. I would like to know um, how many of the um, uh, publishers of of the almanacs uh, how. What what do you think the ratio was uh, of loyalists and and revolutionaries? Of of those who published almanacs. Yes. Good question. I would have to go back to uh, Isaiah Thomas, who was a printer uh, a little bit later than this period. Um, but he was in Boston and then he was in Worcester, Massachusetts, a very important uh, American printer because he was also a collector and he collected newspapers of the time. And he wrote um, a very important publication about the history of printing in colonial America where he, he, he has, he tracked it down he lived until eight, about 1810, 1812. He founded the American Antiquarian Society. And he, he tracked down all of the, the, the colonial printers in all the colonies. He, he names when printing was brought to each colony. And he talks about what they printed and would name whether or not they printed almanacs. And then at a certain point, um, he also says whether or not they were patriots or they were royalists. Those were the two terms that he, he used in his history of, of printing in America. And so what you'd have to go do is you'd have to go back and look at the designations that Isaiah Thomas was assigning to printers, to, to those 18th century printers, and see if, first of all, if he designated them as patriots or as loyalists, and um, if he designated them as loyalists, then, then you could decipher from his work, from his book, whether or not they also printed almanacs. So that, that, would, be the, that would be the key. I don't, I don't have the answer on the, on the tip of my tongue, but that would be how to get at it. I hope that helps. Okay. One more uh, comment, not a question. Um, I have just one Ames almanac and um, I, I'm impressed by his humor. He, yes. He, he was funny. Well, I, I hope that that, that, that reading from the, the bit about temperance would show you <laughs> his, his sense of humor to some, to some degree. I mean, it was serious, but it was also, I thought, I've always thought it was, it's very funny to think about being temperate by not drinking in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you for your comments and your questions. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, I see Jacqueline Williams, you're raising your hand. Yes, could I, I know that the number of literate people was not like it is today, perhaps, but could anyone submit an article to a particular printer of an almanac or did the, the printer, um, or the publisher uh, decide who was going to be, what prose was going to be in the almanac, and he controlled who wrote it. Well, certainly um, 
there was a concept of freedom of the press at the time that meant that if you had something that, that you thought was newsworthy and, need, and should be printed, that you could take it to a printer, that, particularly a printer that printed a newspaper, and they would, they would include it in their newspaper. I think that was more common for what would appear in newspapers than what would appear in an almanac. I think, I think in many cases, well, in the case of, of Nathaniel Ames, he was the writer but he wasn't the printer. He would have he would have to go to Draper or one of these other printers to, to get it printed. Benjamin Franklin is an example of someone who was a printer, but he was also an almanac writer. Uh, so it did it varied, but I think it was more common that it, you would be free to take something to a printer that was printing a newspaper and asked that it be printed in a newspaper and expect that that would be possible. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, see, it, I see Brian has, um, uh, who knows a lot about um, uh, the British publications uh, during, this, during the period we're talking about, that uh, British almanacs were nine pence stitched um, and they were, um, and they were often bound with the St. James Register. Brian, what was, um, what, uh, can you give us a little more information on that? These are the British almanacs, I take it then. Yes. Yeah. Here's, here's an example from 1766, and it's very thick because it's mostly the St. James Register, which is the official uh, government publication or a, a publication of all the government functions and the, the peerage and the dukes and the, and the lords and the commons and all the markets and, uh, and uh, various government agencies, the rates of pay of army officers. But in the front is an almanac very similar to the Ames Almanac, at least uh, for each month. Here's uh, January is two pages. Right. Uh, and uh, very similar information, except the high tide is the high tide at London Bridge. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, that, uh, so that shippers would know when they could get under. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's uh, more commonly uh, around probably because it was bound with the St. James Register and not burned at the, burned at the end of the year. Right, that probably protected it. Well, I think that the first almanac was printed in, in North America in the 17th century, but I think that they may go back to the 16th century, if not, well, the 16th century uh, in, in Britain. I'm not sure if there's any incunable that's considered an almanac. Carol, do you, can you answer that question? I, I don't know. I've certainly never encountered one. Okay. Yeah, the, the British that, theory, this it was, theory... Yeah, this series started in the 1600s. Okay. So, well, certainly yeah. it was something that the colonists brought from from England. Was knowing about almanacs and needing them in their life, their daily life, and then printers saw an opportunity. So, uh, Susan, uh, the Rare Book School, uh, obviously the, the virus has uh, affected your operations. Are, what, are you, what are you doing um, this year or, or, or what are you planning on doing next year? Okay. Uh, uh, well, we learned in April, we had planned to offer 14 courses this year, which was for, for the last few years fairly typical for us that we would offer 14 courses on on various topics having to do with rare books, manuscripts, um, rare photographs, and so forth, uh, and history of the book topics. And we were all set to go. We had, we were publicizing our program. We had all our instructors lined up. Uh, we would have had, um, I think, 10 courses in Southern California at UCLA, and then four, four or five courses uh, in Northern California, in at the at the Bancroft Library in at UC Berkeley, and in, in in San Francisco. So as I say, April comes along, 
and um, we get the edict from UCLA that there will be no instruction in person for summer sessions at UCLA. So we also realized at that point that UC Berkeley was probably going to do the same thing, although they hadn't announced it yet, and of course they did. And the other institutions that we hope to be teaching at uh, in San Francisco would also be in the same situation. So we, we thought about it and we realized that we had two choices or two things, two ways we could go. We could either just cancel the whole thing and be dark for 2020, or we could see if any of the instructors will, were willing to convert their courses to the online environment. And I and uh, the project manager, some of you may know Lisa Mar Mardoyan, who has been project manager for a year or two now, we, we didn't want to let it go. We didn't want it to be dark in uh, 2020 because we thought that it would be hard to come back from that in 2021. So we're, we, we haven't been dark. I sent out an email to all of the instructors explaining them the situation and because of the policy at UCLA, we were going to have to be remote. And I said, think about your course, decide whether or not you could teach it remotely without losing the quality of the course uh, that would have been in person. And they all considered that request very carefully and four, five of them uh, responded that they, they thought that they really could teach their course and have it be just as effective uh, as it would be if it were in per person. So this tomorrow, we will start the second week of California Rare Book School as a remote, remote program. Last week, we had one course uh, English paleography taught by Vanessa Wilkie, who's at the Huntington Library here in Southern California. And I, I lurked in and out of that course all week uh, and it was wonderful. And I think by the end of the week, the students were feeling de delighted. They were feeling like they could read, um, you know, 16th and 17th century English handwriting and manuscripts and it was all done online. It was really quite wonderful to behold. And this week, starting tomorrow, we have history of topography taught by Paul Shaw. And then we have um, teaching with rare materials taught by Rob Montoya and, and um, Michaela Ullman. And then in the third week, um, Melissa Conway is going to be teaching medieval and Renaissance manuscripts, which is a course that she's taught in person for many years but she said two or three years ago, she began thinking about how it could be taught remotely since there are so many uh, manuscripts that have been digitized in our online. So she's teaching that remotely and we feel very good about it. And we have good, good enrollment and we're, we're, we're having our, we have our Wednesday night le lecture ser series. I have to confess, this was my dress rehearsal because the third week not this coming Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday, I'm going to give this talk again. So <laughs> if, you have any, if you have any interest um, in coming to those online talks, um, the one on Wednesday this week is going to be given by Johanna Drucker. Um, and then as I say, I'm giving the one the following week, but uh, just shoot, shoot me an email. Uh, maybe Gary, you can send out my email address if people don't have it and um we'll, we'll, we'll give everybody, you everybody every everybody that um got an email everybody that's on the program today every, all the attendees have your email address there so um but we'll see what else we can do all yeah. right we'll just get send me an email yeah. and we'll put you on the list to receive the id and the password for getting into the lectures they're all they're oh. they're they're on Wednesday at 5.30, both this coming Wednesday and the following week. And the, and for example, but the, 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 the class on the history of topography, I assume that's, that's an enrollment, that's a different, obviously the cost is different for something like that and um, too well, we late have, to, 
Go ahead. The lectures, the, the two lectures that I just referred to, that's free. The, Those uh, are free, yeah. But okay. the, the, the courses, uh, it is a, it's a five-day course, all online, and there is tuition. There right. is a tuition fee. And how long is a, a day a session then on each day then? Well, most, most of the instructors break it into four sessions. Wow. So in the oh, morning, wow. we're talking pretty intensive. Uh, yes. Right. Okay. Wow. Yes. Okay. They, they, because it's online, they've tried to find some ways to break up the online and Zoom time. So, so uh, this last week, the English paleography course, uh, there, the students from the very beginning of the week, the students had a certain assignment to make a presentation on a, on a transcription that they would make by the end of the week. And so there were times during the week when there was time to, to work on that and the instructor, Vanessa Wilkie, had what she was calling office hours where you would get, where the students would get a one-on-one -on -one with her to ask questions and have help from her on what they were, were working on. And I think each, I think the, um, the course on teaching with rare materials, uh, they're going to make a few different visits to people, again, who are, are curators and librarians at other institutions that they normally would have visited, but they're not going to be able to visit them physically, but they will be visiting them online. And I think Paul Shaw is going to make it make a few visits the same way to the um, he's from New York, so he'll be teaching it from New York. But he was hoping to visit the letter form archive in San Francisco and a few other things. And I know Melissa will be, be visiting resources at the Getty Museum and the Getty Research Institute. So wonderful. They, well, they sound like very rich. To, they're finding ways to break it up. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Well, very rich offerings. So let uh, if you could send um, um, me or me and uh, uh, me, perhaps me and Cindy um, information on the two free lectures. Um, okay. That would be great. Um, uh, because Cindy does the emails out, and maybe we could do an email out to our to our members. Um, would that be? I hate to put, give Cindy um, um, work, but uh. I'll, I'll do my best. I, I just want to mention that I just um, worked with Constant Contact to bring our um, our template into the third generation editor, so that I could continue using it. And I have had no experience with that yet, so I'll oh, I'll, I see. I'll, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, good. We're good all deal. really learning. This was the first time that I that I've been on Zoom and presented a PowerPoint, so that went well, very did, well. <laughs> you did great. great. Yeah, Thank two you. thumbs up. Yeah, it was just Thank terrific. You. Yeah, no, very enjoyable. I certainly learned. I I enjoy early American history, and I earned, learned uh, you know some, some some more interesting detail about. Uh, life back in those Good. days. Yes, for sure. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there, um, if there's nothing else, then um, uh, any, uh, I want to um, uh, thank everybody for spending uh, a nice sunny Sunday afternoon here with uh, Susan and, um, and, and again, express my appreciation for you, Susan, for doing this for for our, uh, for our members. It was just my, my pleasure. I look forward to participating in other things that the Book Club of Washington yeah. does. And, so uh, uh, we, enjoy your, your, your publication, your journal. Oh, yes. Um, and we've had some, I think, some excellent articles for sure um, um, uh, in, you know, in recent, uh, in the last, well, uh, for years we have. And, and I think David Wertheimer is doing a terrific job as editor. So, Tamara, I want to thank you for, um, for incurring, uh, she's identified a couple of uh, professors up at uh, Western Washington Uni University who will who can who will talk on a couple of interesting subjects. Uh, we're to, we're going to schedule them for um, October and November, so we'll do a similar kind of sessions then. So we'll be letting everybody know about those when we firm them up. Again, thanks everybody. Uh, have a good um, have a good Sunday. I'm gonna. Unless I have an objection, I'm going to be uh, ending the meeting. All right. Bye-bye. Nice to Fair see you. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Have a nice Thank evening. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.
Bye.